All right, we are in Genesis chapter 19. We are studying Sodom and its implications and what God, uh, what God was doing when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The message that he was sending, the judgment that he passed down was a serious judgment. Um, this is really the first time, I guess, uh, since the flood that God has poured out his wrath upon a particular people. In this case, it was, it was four cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, uh, Adma, and Zeboam. Did I say those right? I think I did. Um, we're not told much about the other, we're not told much about Gomorrah, we're not told much about uh, Adma and Zeboam, but we assume that they were in a similar situation as Sodom, but God is focused on Sodom. When we, uh, when we refer to somebody who has a homosexual nature, we do not call them Gomorrites. There's not, a, there's not a law on the books in the state of Missouri that charges someone with Gomorrahizing someone. But we do charge them with sodomizing someone. That is a, it's an offense. And um, so Sodom is the city. It is the city of, that shows God's judgment, God's wrath. God pouring it out upon people and he leaves it that way in a place where there's almost no rain so that the remnants there of the city can still be seen. The brimstone or sulfur chunks can be seen all around that area. Um, and when you light them on fire, they burn extremely hot. And it's safe to say that everybody and everything in that town was burnt up and everything probably within a certain amount of, I wouldn't guess how many yards or meters outside of the gate of Sodom was burnt up as well, but I would imagine it would be quite a long distance that you could not stand nor bear the heat from Sodom. It was uh, as, a, as a furnace. Uh, let's look at, uh, once again, uh, let's see here, verse 27 of Genesis 19. And Abraham got up early in the morning uh, to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. Lot went up out of Zohar, dwelt in the mountains and his two daughters with him for he feared to dwell in Zohar and he dwelt in a cave he and his daughters. And we're not going to get into the rest of that uh, today, but um, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, let me get to where uh, I think I'm going. To, yeah, let's, let's do this here. Uh, we'll look at Deuteronomy 32 once again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord bless you, and I appreciate you coming this afternoon. Appreciate all you folks online. We love you. We thank God for you. Uh, you people online have made our church uh, into probably one of the most unique churches uh, in the world. Uh, although we have a small congregation here, uh, we have a large following outside of the walls of this place. And I appreciate all of those who listen in. I appreciate those who join in live. Uh, we even have people who actually attend church somewhere. Uh, and when they come home, they pull up our services. 
uh, Brother um, Wayne Dinwiddie um, reminded me that uh, he listens a lot to me. And uh, he, he said again, he said there's many times when I've been playing your sermons there as I lay my head down at night and I play them and I go to sleep uh, while you're preaching. And I said, that's, that's nothing out of the ordinary. I have people in my church who go to sleep while I'm preaching. So it's, I'm used to it both ways. Doesn't bother me a bit. Uh, that just means you've got confidence that I've got everything under control and nothing needs your uh, attention. So anyway, Deuteronomy 32, let's read this. For their rock is not as our rock. And again, I want you to notice the capitalization there, the R. Even our enemies themselves being judges, for their vine is the vine of Sodom, and the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. I want you to understand that and, and just let that sink into you. That the lifestyle that what most churches want you to lead. A lifestyle that allows you to keep whatever sins that you have. A church that lets you keep the sins that you have. And yet teaches you about a God and about a Jesus that somehow doesn't transform you from a sinner to a saint, but I guess it just transforms you into a much more successful sinner, I'm supposing. Because that seems what seems to be coming out of modern churchianity uh, in these days. So I'll be talking a little bit about that tonight. Their wine is the poison of dragons, the Bible says. Think about that. Who is the dragon? The dragon, of course, is, is Satan. But it's the poison of dragons, plural. There are seducing spirits. And the Bible says doctrines of devils. God warned about the gods. And he, then he called them devils. And he said, beware of anybody who would say, let us go after other gods. That man that I mentioned this morning, you pray for him. You don't know him. You don't. It, he's uh, Brother Wayne's nephew, but grew up in church, went to Christian school, went to Bible college, and is practicing all forms of magic, including astral projection, married a practicing witch, and uh, their house is full of the bitterness that the wine of Sodom brings. They may be seeking happiness and they may think they have found it, but I guarantee you, God doesn't just save us out of a no fun lifestyle. He doesn't save us and say, now I don't want you to have no fun no more. Shoot. Sometimes when I read this Bible, I have fun. Amen. I mean, I get happy with it. But that leaves you in a, in, in sin always leaves you a very bitter human being. So he said, their wine is a poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? Heavenly Father, I pray to you, Lord, tonight that you would bless the message. Lord God, that you would help me to preach it. And help me, dear God, as I go through these scriptures, remind us, dear God, of how important it is that our Bible be right. How important, God, that this word be preserved. How absolutely necessary the guide that we have in these last days be an accurate compass, an accurate road map, and, and uh, accurate way of life that teaches us the way that we ought to be, Father, so that we do not err as we go into these last days. 
The lies are being told all around us. And Father, those lies are easy to follow. They're easy to get into. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would deliver your people from those lies, from the, from the false prophets, the false teachers, the false trumpet blowers on the internet. God, would you take your people and make them a pure people and sanctify them with the word of truth, Father, tonight. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, anytime I come across this passage and it mentions the vine of Sodom, uh, remember, let's, let's go back very quickly and, and let's uh, get our thinking caps on. That brings back memories. I turn to Ezekiel uh, 16. That brings back memories when my teacher would tell us, let's put our thinking caps on. We would all go like this and Acted like we were putting our thinking cap on. So everybody put your remembering cap on and remember what the, what the actual sin of Sodom was. The act of sodomy and the perversion of sodomy is the, is the outcome. It's the byproduct of the real disease. Uh, the real disease is, let's look in verse 48 of Ezekiel 16. I'll give you a second to turn there. God said, as I live, verse 48, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, hath, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. What a statement to make. That God destroyed Sodom because her sins were so bad that God didn't have a choice but to destroy them. But now he says to Jerusalem, which is supposed to be the city of God, Gary, the city of God. He says to Jerusalem, your sins, you've gone way past what your sister Sodom did. And sometimes you have to ask the question, why didn't God destroy Jerusalem? Well, he eventually did. In A.D. 70, burnt the town to the ground. And I also believe it is going to be destroyed again. And it's just what I believe. And I think that's going to be one of the signs to look for is the destruction of Jerusalem. The book of Revelation calls Jerusalem, Sodom and Egypt, both of them together, calls Jerusalem on this earth. People say, have you ever gone to the Holy Land? No, I've not died yet and gone to heaven. I mean, I know what they mean. Have you ever taken a trip to Israel? No, I haven't. I'm not sure. I'm just not sure that I want to. Um, maybe it would be interesting. I don't know. Maybe, it, maybe I would learn some things. I don't know. Maybe. But I'm not particularly interested in that city. Because it's ruled over by... Islam, Judaism, and false Christianity. They call the three Abrahamic religions, and it's ruled over by all three, and I don't really believe that I would want to be any part of that. The Catholic Church loves to figure out where stuff is in the Bible, and they, put, they always put some sort of uh, idol there. For people to go and pray to and bow down to and all that kind of nonsense. So Jerusalem. Now suckling from the vine of Sodom. And Jerusalem receives then the poison of dragons. And the bitter taste of the venom of asps. 
And God's not playing around when he does this. But then, let's go to, uh, oh, I, didn't, I didn't read to you um, Ezekiel 16, verse 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Three things, pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. Now let me, let me run something by you real quick and tell you where I believe the world is headed. We go to Sam's usually about every Friday, Sam's Club, and they have an irritating floor cleaner. It's a robot. There's no one on it. No one with a deal moving it around like this. It senses where people are. It senses where the shelves are. It senses everything in its surroundings. It avoids it. And it goes around cleaning the floor. And that, that aggravates me. I don't like it. We watched cartoons back in the 50s of how the modern houses of the 21st century would be and everything would be automa automatic and autonomous and robots would be doing everything. If you watch the Jetsons, the robots do everything, computers do everything. Well, we're getting to that point now. And what has happened is, now there's a guy at Walmart who's, who's got one of those machines, looks like a Zamboni at an ice skating rink. He sits on it, drives it around. It drives real slow, but he drives it around. That's his job. But now they've taken away his job and turned that over to a computer. They don't have to pay for the computers or for the robots. They don't have to pay for its health insurance. They don't have to pay for its life insurance. They don't have to pay its social security. They don't have to pay for anything like that. It's cheaper to have that as a robot. Give it a little maintenance every now and then. Tell it to sweep the floors and mop the floors and everything like that. And that's where everything's going. At some point, artificial intelligence will become so, so intelligent that literally there will be a machine that will be able to do most of the jobs that are being done now by human workers. It will be able to do those jobs better and more efficient and faster and there are no labor laws for robots so robots can work longer than eight hours. Just keep them plugged in. They can work 10 hours, 16 hours, 24 hours, 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours. They can run nonstop if they need them to be. And the, the more that we get into that, those days, the less jobs there are going to be for people. Well, they already have a solution for this. It is called... Um, a, what is it, automatic, I mean, that's not the word automatic, ba something basic income. And it's, it, it's where the government and the companies are working together because artificial intelligence can play the stock market like gambling and do good at it and build wealth these companies no longer need man to give them wealth and produce wealth. They can produce their own wealth. And so oh, it's universal basic income is what I was saying. So the plan is to eventually give everybody a sack of money every month and say, enjoy your life. Do what? It is dangerous. It is dangerous. And I don't mind is the devil's workshop. There is no doubt that's not a biblical statement, but I guarantee it's biblical. Okay? 
And uh, so the, the abundance of idleness is coming, not just to a few, but it's coming for everyone. Well, there will no longer be humans needed to do the jobs that are out there. They will be done by machines and they will be done probably better and faster than machine than humans can do them. Okay? You just watch and see over the next 10 years how many jobs are taken over by computers. Okay? So that was the sins of Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, the abundance of idleness. And so... All these people telling you, you deserve the good life, you deserve to live the leisurely life, the comfortable life, you deserve to have this, you deserve to have that. God wants your belly full, God wants to bless you with plenty of food, God wants to give you lots of money, God wants you to, hey, and hey, be proud of yourself, God, you know, the way you are, be proud of, of, of how you are, and on and on. That's what's coming out of the modern churches, and the reason is... It's because those pastors are suckling from the vine of Sodom. They're drawing their sermons and their messages from that vine. And they're lying through their teeth to everybody. Now turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Wonderful, wonderful chapter. Jesus in contrast... To the vine of Sodom. Says I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. He's the one. The, his father is the one. Who grows the vine. Who is in charge of the vine. And desires that the vine be productive. I believe. And if you just stop and think about it. God. I believe the nature of God is that God loves beauty. And you think about it. God loves beauty. He loves a, a beautiful garden. He planted a beautiful garden in the midst. Uh, and Adam and Eve lived there. And it was absolute heaven. And Adam and Eve were given that garden to live in and to tend to it. And I'm sure it wasn't very much work at all. Just pick fruit. Pick fruit. It's all you got to do. Eat whatever you want. Drink whatever you want. Everything's fine. And they had it perfect there. And God had created a beautiful place. Now, I cannot imagine what New Jerusalem is going to look like. But I believe I'll see it one of these days. And I will be in awe of its beauty, its grandeur. He even paved the streets with gold. That's amazing. Amen. That's beautiful. So now watch this. Jesus said, I'm the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Now, the husbandman wants that vine to be productive and beautiful. There's nothing more beautiful than a grape vine full of grapes. Amen. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, I, I love you. I'm just telling you how it is. Ask God. And, and, and I will say this to you. You cannot produce the fruit. If you do, it'll be corrupt. If you do it, it will be corrupt. And there are corrupt churches... That have magnified themselves, magnified their works. Why, we bust in, you know, 150 kids and we brought in all of these people into the church and we sent teams out 
soul winning everywhere and we saved uh, half of this town and they all come to this church. I've heard them brag like that before. We baptized so, so, so many people last month. Our water bill went up 20%. We baptized that many people. And boy, we're just doing this and doing that. They're boasting on their works. And it is their works. And since it's their works, it's corrupt and it won't last. What they may have is a church full of false conversions. False conversions. And they will reap the consequences over that. So he said, and, and, I, and I'm just, what I'm saying to you about that is, if you want your life to be fruitful for God, ask Him, rely upon Him, lean upon Him, trust Him, turn your eyes toward Him, pray to Him, think about His Word, uh, involve yourself in His Word. Read His Word. Study His Word. Meditate on His Word. And all of that going in you. God is changing things in your life. And you're going to be manifesting. Let's turn to Galatians. Boy, I turned right to it. I did. I turned right to it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. You put yourself in this Bible and all of a sudden you will love people that you could not love before. And you'll love them right. You'll love them right. You won't want to see them die and go to hell. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. God will give you an inner joy, an inner peace. That will last and last and last. Peace is what he says next. Long suffering. God will allow you to suffer long with people. God will, uh, one of the things that God has convinced me of as a pastor is to not try to push people to change things in their life. To not constantly be a busybody in everybody's life wanting to know what all they're doing wrong and sit down with them and say, now, yeah, I think you need to change this in your life. I think you need to work on this a little bit. I think you need to do this or whatever. I don't do that. I don't, I don't see it that way. I don't pastor that way. I have, I have prayed for people and I've seen God make changes in people's lives. That when God made the change, I'm telling you, it was there forever. Amen. Amen. And had I got involved, I probably would have messed it up. You see, God will give you the gift of long suffering with people. The way God long suffered with Israel. The way God long suffers with all of us. Love, joy, peace, long suffering gentleness he'll give you a gentle spirit not a brawling spirit not one that's wanting to fight all the time that's not, not a spirit that's wanting to smart off all the time not a spirit that's wanting to rail against people all the time he'll make you a gentle person you'll be full of goodness you will you'll be full of goodness people will say about you he's a really good guy i like him he's a really good really good person or she's a really good gal I like, I like this person. They, they just seem like good people. Uh, I can tell you that the family that died, Dick and Betty Boyer, they were good people. They were really good people. That, they, it is quite a loss to lose them. They were, wherever they heard there was a camp meeting, they loaded up their RV. I don't know what they had and they took off in it and went down there just to hear preaching. They were good people. God gave them that as a gift. Goodness. Faith. You need to be increased in faith. Meekness. Temperance. That means that you don't just fly off the handle at everything that happens. Everything that goes wrong. You don't explode all, all over everybody. You've been tempered. 
You've been taken through the fire and hardened. Your molecules have been changed. And now you're not as weak as you used to be. And now you can, you can sort of handle some of the pressure that life brings. Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. These are the fruits now that God, in fact, let me, I've got nine more. Let me give you nine more. Turn to 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12. Look at verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. For there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are, differences, there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. When you start comparing preachers among preachers, be careful, don't do that. God didn't make us all the same. Um, I look at Mike Hutzel. Man, if I needed somebody to plan something, Mike Hutzel would be the guy I'd go to. I wouldn't do it myself. I'd make a mess of it. He has a, he has a administrative gift that God has given him in the ministry. He, in fact, he took over a church one time. He wasn't sure why God was leading him to this particular church. But they, they voted him in, he accepted, and, and he just, you know, wasn't sure what God was going to do with him there. And one day he was in his office and one of the deacons or somebody like that come in, the church treasurer or something like that came in with the church's uh, financial books and laid it on the pastor's desk and showed Brother Mike Hutzel how many thousands of dollars they were in debt. And he said, this is what we have to deal with here. We've got to, somehow we've got to erase this debt. And Mike prayed about it that week and he stood up before that church that Sunday and he said, I do believe that God has called me here to this church. No doubt about it. But I'm going to tell you what God has told me. God has told me that he has brought me here to shut this church down. And everybody went. And he said, yes, that's exactly right. We're going to shut this thing down. This church is, I don't know how many thousands of dollars it was in debt. And he said, this church is in debt. And he said, there's a reason why this church is in debt. And you're sitting on the reason why it's in debt. And he said, so what I'm going to do is work and strive to sell everything in this church, pay off the debts. We will dissolve this organization and you folks can go find another church. And he meant it. He wasn't kidding. And God used that message. They had a big turnout at the altar. Everybody prayed, everybody cried. And within just a few months, they had erased all the debts that they had occurred over the last several years, God blessed that man with the administrative ability to do that. That's Mike Hutzel. That's not Mike Hoggard. Guarantee you that's not Mike Hoggard. But God gives, he says, give, he gives gift to men. The ministration, verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith. By the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Nine of them, again, nine of them. Nine is the number for fruit bearing. So these are the gifts that God has given to his people over the years. And God has blessed men with these several things. I don't have what other people have and you don't have what I have. But God gives it all out the way he wants it. And we'll all work together. and We'll all get to heaven on the same day. Somebody say amen. Now back in John chapter 15. He said, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. 
and uh, he and and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. That is the Father's desire, that your life brings forth and manifests fruit. Now, it doesn't matter. It's not a contest. Don't you ever be guilty of the sin of jealousy over what somebody is doing in the church versus what you're doing in the church. Don't you ever be guilty of that sin. Somebody could, God could bless them and, and put it in their heart and they could just go and just start inviting people and all of a sudden people start showing up to church. Well, who are these people? Well, I invited them this week. And they just start inviting people everywhere. People start coming in and People could start getting saved and people started joining the church. And I mean, that could happen. And you're sitting there going, well, I was just thinking he's bringing in the wrong kind of people here. I mean, that's not our type of people. I mean, look, look at those people. Hey, don't worry about that. They're sinners. They need to be saved by grace. Amen. Don't worry about it. Let God handle it. But if you see that your life is not manifesting fruit, then don't look at the one who's inviting everybody to church and they're all coming. That was a gift that God gave them. Ask God to give you one. Ask God to give you a gift. By the way, they're free. Aren't they? Gifts are free. Tax deductible too, by the way. The Father will purge the vine. He'll work in you. And He will, He will produce the fruit. He just asks you to bear the fruit. Many times I've laid upon my face and said, God, please make me fruitful for your kingdom. God, do something in my life. God, use me for something. God, br bring, bring forth and manifest the fruit of your spirit in my life. I want that more than I want anything in my life. That's what I want. You do that. God will bless that. God will hear you and God will bless that. Verse 3. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, say amen. You can't do it either. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself. People say, well, I'm a Christian. I just don't go to church. Now, let me tell you, now, I know we got folks that are online, but that this is their church. And we and they treat it that way. We treat it that way. But there are some who are so down on every church. There is no church. Number one, that they ever want to attend. Number two, there's no church that would want them to attend. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, I'm threatening to come to your church. And I said, yeah, come on. He said, no, I'm threatening to come to your church. And I, I listened to him. He was a very rough boned man. Very rough boned. I believe he was a good guy at heart. But he was rough. And if something didn't go the way he wanted, he would he would be somebody that would cause trouble. So he's, he's never come. But anyway, verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Without me, who's me? The Word of God. Without the Word of God, 
You can do nothing. Period. There will be no fruit. There will be no manifestation. There will be no gift. There will be nothing. You cannot do it when you absent yourself from Bible study, Bible reading, Bible memory, Bible meditation. Think about the Bible, what, whatever it takes. If you want a copy of the King James Bible on CD, come, come see me. We'll get you one. You can listen to it on your way to work, on your way back home from work, on your way to the grocery store, or wherever it is you go. You can listen to it and let the words, faith cometh by hearing. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how much of that God will work in you. I'm telling you, it's good stuff. He said, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Do you believe the Bible? Say amen. This is not a charismatic preacher preaching this. This is not Benny Hinn saying this. This is not Dr. Joyce Myers saying this with her 200 facelifts. Why didn't God just heal her face? Why didn't she have enough faith for her wrinkles to go away from her lips? Now she looks, she looks like the Joker to me. Doesn't she? She looks like the Joker from Batman to me. But anyway... Um, they didn't say this. God said this. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Learn how to pray. Learn how to ask God for things. Learn how to ask God to bless your life. Learn how to ask God to bless other people's lives. Learn how to ask God to bless your church. Learn how to ask God to bless your pastor and your pastor's family. Learn how to ask God to bless your neighbors that are around about you so you don't have a bunch of enemies around you. Learn how to ask God for everything in life. Learn how to pray. God will give it to you. And you'll start believing, well, maybe this prayer thing works. Maybe it does. I am convinced that it does. I'm telling you I'm convinced it does. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples, that you bear much fruit. I'm challenging you tonight. Ask God, God, what do you want me doing? Somebody in this church recently, I say recently, it was this year, asked me how they, they could know they were in God's will. And I said, well, it's pretty easy. Wherever place you are, that's where God wanted you. And if God didn't want you there, you wouldn't be there. And I believe it's that simple. But I also believe as I, as I fasted and prayed three days for God to move in this church in 2008, I did not ask God to make us a mega church. I did not ask God to give me radio stations to run. I did not ask God to give me Thousands of people to feed. I did not ask God any of those things. I just asked God. God show me what you want me to do. And I'll do it. Show me what you want me to do. And God showed me. 
And so what's that been? 12 years? Going on 13 years. January of 2022. It'll be 13 years. And what God has done with those three days in prayer... It blows my mind away. But what I was asking God to do was make me fruitful. I wanted to bear fruit, not for me, for God's kingdom. That's what I wanted. And I pray that God will put that hunger in your heart, that you would ask God, God, Show me what you want me to do. And I'll do it. And I promise you, whatever it is, it'll be the easiest thing in the world for you to do. Because that's what God does. Let's stand for prayer. Easiest thing in the world. Matthew is here to tell you That the day we closed the school down, we tore out all those offices. And what did we do after that, Chili Putty? Painted a wall green and put a camera in front of it. And I had absolutely no idea why. I didn't have the first clue what I was going to do with it. But a couple weeks later, when God said, Mike, do this Watchman broadcast, I went, I got a camera in front of a green wall. Easiest thing in the world for me to do. Father, bless these people. Lord, none of us, none of us are too old To bear fruit. None of us are. None of us are too young. None of us are too sinful. None of us are. That's the things the devil puts in people's heads. You're too old. You're too young. You don't know what you're doing. You're so full of sin. God can't use you anyway. Those are the things the devil puts in our minds. Father, I pray, dear God, that each and every person hearing my voice tonight would ask you that question. God, show me what you want me to do. And I'll do it. I'll do it for your kingdom. I'll do it for your glory, your namesake. And God, I don't want the credit out of it. I just want to know, God, that I'm being used for your kingdom. Because there's no greater thrill in my life than to know that I was used to to help build your kingdom. That I was used to help somebody who was lost on their way. To help somebody who needed help. To give water to someone who was thirsty. To pray for somebody who need prayed for. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless these people with such gifts. That they would manifest them in their lives and be manifested in their lives. And show the world what wondrous things God has done for each one of us. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said... Amen.